For folks who don't know Steve, he's our lead technical content creator at Octopus Deploy. And I invited him to come and share some of the highlights that he's documented in a recent white paper that he's published entitled uh, A Modern View of Multi-Tenancy. Steve, thanks for taking the time to do this. We really appreciate it. What I might do now is just kick over to you and you can share with us your thoughts on the right, the white paper you wrote. Yeah, so um, the white paper um, is called A Modern View of Multi-Tenancy. Um, and it's not just my thoughts. This is the thoughts of a whole bunch of smart people at Octopus who have been helping customers with multi-tenancy. And also Octopus has a multi-tenanted solution as well. So there's a lot of knowledge kind of distilled into this. And what we're hoping with is that people will read this uh, white paper, but also start a discussion with us um, and like ask questions and challenge what we're saying, because we want to try and define a new era of multi-tenancy based on new technology. Um, basically, this is what we're going to try and talk about today. Um, it's a picture of the white paper there. I also have a copy of it here. Ooh, that um, looks nice. <laughs> basically, we want to talk about multi-tenancy now being less about just software multi-tenancy, more about lots of different layers. So we'll go into some detail in that in a minute. Yeah, you can kind of go and download it right now from this URL. What can we talk about with multi-tenancy? I think probably the best place to start is why did we create multi-tenancy in the first place? Yeah, why did we? <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, there's a similar story when it comes to something like version control. Um, the first place I worked, version control was a bunch of sticky notes on a wall. And if you wanted to edit a file, you had to go to the wall and take the sticky note. And if you had the sticky note, you were allowed to edit it. And if you didn't have a sticky note, you couldn't touch it. That was basically how version control worked. <laughs> um, and then people made software that did that for us. Um, and it did the same thing. You could press a button and it would lock that file just for your use. Um, and then until you put that file back, no one else could edit it. Um, so the first version of version control was like a, a similar to what we were doing in the physical world, turned into a piece of software. And I think multi-tenancy has a similar path because people were self-hosting the software and that was really difficult to do. And these application service providers came along and said, hey, we can host it for you, buy the software, we'll install it on hardware that will operate for you and give you access to it. So it makes your life easier. So when software vendors started doing this hosting on behalf of customers, I think they followed that same pattern. And they said, um, we'll kind of give them dedicated infrastructure. And then that turns out to be quite expensive. So can we simulate that inside of the software? So you try to create in the software this isolation, this kind of like dedicated infrastructure, but virtually in the software. So I think that's what the first version of multi-tenancy was. It was like paving the cow path of what application service providers were doing before the software vendors started doing it for themselves. I kind of think that's got out of date now. Um, I don't know how you feel about it, but um, you know, in those days, a lot of people were hosting either on physical servers or on virtual machines, and that was kind of expensive to do at the time. So I think we need a new approach because the technology has changed so much. This is uh, four pictures really about traditional multi-tenancy. The bottom left section is what we think is multi-tenanted software. You've got a, an app instance and a database instance and everyone piles in and uses it. Um, and we know that there are some variations of this because if you've got a compute heavy app, you might have a single database but have multiple apps, uh, one for each tenant. or the other way around, you might have um, a single app, but then have the data completely separate, separate databases for each tenant. So those are variations that have emerged. Um, and then the top right corner, this is kind of complete isolation, which traditionally isn't called multi-tenancy. It's like the, the antithesis of multi-tenancy. Um, we're kind of hoping that we can challenge that view a little bit. Um, that's kind of where our white paper comes from. So I suppose, I want to talk a little bit about tenant density. Now, originally with multi-tenancy, people wanted to get um, the most number of tenants onto the fewest number of CPUs. It's about cramming stuff in. Um, and this is a picture from the city of Munster in Germany. Um, they were demonstrating the difference between uh, the same number of people using cars, bicycles, or a bus. And it's all about like getting, how can we get more people with, with taking up less space on the road. And that's how we were thinking of multi-tenancy. 
Um, it's like, how can we get as many people as possible on here? Um, but that was like a proxy for the real um, problem, which was uh, cost effectively hosting um, software for all of these people. Um, and the reason that these things were considered the same, I think, was because virtual machines were expensive. Um, and that was what was available as the alternative. So that's, that's I think, um, tenant density is a proxy. We need to kind of get below that and talk about, like, just it's about money, right? I want to host all my tenants, but I don't want to spend, you know, millions of pounds doing it. So that brings us to new economics, or what I think are the true economics of multi-tenancy, which is you've got hundreds of trade-offs. Um, you can decide to spend the money uh, one way or another, but you're going to be spending money. Um, whether you spend it on infrastructure or whether you spend it on much more complex code or a much more complicated um, operations picture, you're going to spend the money somewhere. So you just want to find the place where the money's doing the most effective thing. Um, so that's, that's what I think we want to move to. It's a slightly more complicated model. And have a picture here. This isn't the model that everyone should use, but it's an example um, of different types of complexity. So we've got here um, code complexity is probably the simplest one to think of. If everyone is using the same application instance, then you have to deal with things like um, noisy neighbors somehow within your application code. So your code gets a lot more complicated and you have to make sure that the data is completely isolated so no one sees something that they shouldn't see. Um, so now your testing effort's more expensive. Um, and that's how we want to think of these things, um, I think, is that we want to think about code complexity costs money just the same as infrastructure costs money. So where's the right balance between the two? Um, and the problem with that trade-off is I can create a spreadsheet that tells me exactly how much my infrastructure costs. Um, you know, I can go onto a cloud cost calculator and type in a number of services that I want to use that give me a precise to the cent amount of money that I'm going to be spending. Um, so if I reduce it, I can see how much money I'm going to save. Um, when it comes to something like code complexity, I have no idea. There's no spreadsheet that's going to tell me how much uh, multi-tenancy is going to add to my maintenance costs for software. Um, and based on experience, it turns out to be a lot of money, um, like a surprisingly high number. Um, so, so yeah, I think there's a problem that the availability of infrastructure numbers means that people tend to focus on that when they're thinking about the cost and they, they don't realize how much they might be spending from their future budget by making things more complicated. So what does multi-tenancy look like now that we've got a load of new technology? For example, um, virtual machines were expensive because you had to have licenses on every single virtual machine and you had to have all the disk space for all those operating systems. We've now got things like containers, which completely change that. The new view of multi-tenancy it's still a question about how do we share parts of our system between multiple tenants, but we now add some additional layers. So in the middle um, of the diagram, we've got traditional software multi-tenancy where we're going to share an application instance and a database instance and probably some storage. Um, we're now going to wrap that with pipeline sharing, which we're often already doing. We're sharing the same code base. Hopefully we're sharing the same build process, the same artifact that comes out of that same deployment process. Um, and we also want to add in infrastructure multi-tenancy, um, uh, which is where we are using either a modern technique like containerization, which brings costs down of having dedicated infrastructure, or it might be that we're using like on-premises low-powered machines. Um, you know, it's to deliver software to lots of locations. And that's a lot cheaper than it, than it is to put in a rack and um, all of the associated costs around like trying to serve software from a location. So I think modern technology is like going to transform this picture. And um, I think in a lot of cases, we're going to find that infrastructure multi-tenancy, when supported with the right tools, is going to turn out to be a lot cheaper than making your application more complex by introducing multi-tenancy within your code base. Um, so uh, when I say about tools here, if you're going to manually be configuring infrastructure, the cost suddenly gets a lot more expensive for infrastructure. But if you can automate it, then actually it's like way cheaper. Um, so, so there are some kind of provisions in there. Um, and in some cases, you'll probably find that certain applications still, either because it does make 
economic sense or because it's a feature of that software, they still might opt to do software multi-tenancy. So we're definitely not saying don't look at software multi-tenancy, but we think it probably applies to a smaller group of problems than it's currently solving. So um, the final thing I wanted to kind of cover is the, the decision, um, although it's an architectural decision, isn't one decision that you make for your whole system. It's probably one that you make for different components. Um, so this diagram here is like an example where we've got an authorization component, which is multi-tenanted software. We've got an instance of authorization running. Anyone who wants to log in kind of goes to that instance to get permission to use the application. And that's pretty common. I think we see that almost every time we log into anything, we kind of get presented with a, a screen, which is like a, a single sign-in screen from a particular provider. And then we get passed on to the application. For the main application, I think there's a lot of arguments to say that we should isolate at the infrastructure level because it makes things a lot easier when it comes to keeping that data secure. Um, and also for things like um, service levels, because if you give someone an allocation of resources in infrastructure, it's much easier to make sure they're not using too much um, processing, You know, whether it's database units or CPU or whatever it is they might be doing. Um, I think we've all worked on an application where someone's um, run a report and everyone else is just locked until that report is finished. <laughs> it's like this, like the date range of everything ever. <laughs> um, and I think there's also some services that you might be able to extract, which either are completely stateless um, or don't have tenant data. They have more like static data, like address lookups or tax calculations where you don't need to multi-tenant it at all. You just run that particular service and all of the tenants can call to that service. Obviously you'd still scale it, but you'd be now scaling based on the demand rather than it being like a one-to-one -one relationship with the tenant. So, so yeah, I think the, the argument there is that you'd make the decision at a component level, not a system level. You can go and check out our white paper. It's available online now. Uh, and all we ask is just for some minor details, uh, and then the white paper itself is about 30 or so pages long. Uh, some of the images you saw here in Steve's presentation are directly from the white paper. But uh, more importantly, we want to hear what you think. What do you think about Steve and others' view on multi-tenancy? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Let us know, and you can do so by joining our Slack channel. Inside the community, you'll find a link to our Slack channel here. Uh, that you click that link, you get access to our community, and then you can let us know what you think. So, uh, thanks a lot, Steve. Really appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us. Thanks. Thanks for letting me come and have a chat about multi-tenancy.